is China hiding its COVID numbers. Mortuaries are reportedly over capacity, but official COVID deaths and hospitalization rates are low. As China eases its zero COVID policy, we ask if years of lockdowns only postponed the deadliest wave. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is COVID in China. The Shanghai hospital has told its staff to prepare for a tragic battle with COVID-19, expecting half of the city's 25 million people to contract the virus by the end of the year. After three years of zero COVID policy, it seems China might be ill-prepared to cope with the consequences of easing restrictions. Vaccination rates lag well behind Beijing's Western counterparts. And for those who are vaccinated, the efficacy of China's non-mRNA shots is significantly lower. Here's a look at some of the numbers. Case numbers are surging across China, with around 38,000 active cases following the easing of the strict zero-COVID policy. China has reported almost 5,000 COVID-related deaths since the pandemic began, which is very low compared to many much less populous countries. WHO is very concerned over the evolving situation in China, with increasing reports of severe disease. In order to make a comprehensive risk assessment of the situation on the ground, WHO needs more detailed information on disease severity, hospital admissions, and requirements for ICU support. WHO is supporting China to focus its efforts on vaccinating people at the highest risk across the country and we continue to offer our support for clinical care and protecting its health system. The WHO is urging China to step up vaccinations, especially for the elderly, who are most at risk. Currently, around 40% of over 80s in the country are fully vaccinated. China has nine domestically developed and approved COVID vaccines, the best achieving around 50% efficacy but none has been updated to target the highly infectious Omicron variant. So as cases surge, reports of overflowing hospitals and mortuaries are covering the media. Even crematoriums have lines and waiting lists, with some saying additional payments in the thousands of dollars are now required to expedite the remains of their loved ones. Some hospitals are turning people away or asking sick patients to wait untreated, while pharmacies run out of medicine. Of course we're worried. We definitely will feel concerned and panicked if we can't get medicine. The COVID situation is terrible now. People who live with the elderly and children and migrant workers like us all need to prepare some medicine. How can you fight against the virus without medicine? So how bad will it get for China? And could the fallout show the zero COVID policy was flawed all along for the country and even the world? Well, joining me now to debate that are from New York, Yasha Wang. She is senior China researcher at Human Rights Watch. In Hong Kong, we have China strategist Andrew Lung. And in the UK, Mohammed Munir is a professor of virology at Lancaster University. Thanks all so much for joining me. Uh, Yasho, we know there were human rights issues under zero COVID. Now at the opposite extreme, there are zero controls. There's no monitoring. Is this equally bad? for the Chinese? I think so. I mean, when it was zero COVID policy, people had problems accessing to uh, medical care, medicine, food, and other necessities. But the, at the time, the lack of access to medical care was because they had other illnesses that it was not COVID, but because they were locked in their homes, so they could not get it to a hospital to treat their cancer, to treat their uh, kidney diseases. But now people have similar problems, which is the lack of access to uh, medicine and medical care. But it, it was because of a COVID. People couldn't get to, to the hospital to be treated because they were flooded with people. People couldn't get to the basic, uh, you know, fever medicine like epipropyl. So, I mean, the problems are the same, but the reasons are different. Right. But knowing that this really started, the change in policy started with some very serious protests in China, uh, unprecedented, really. 
I mean, is it good to know that protest voices were actually heard or kind of ironic that um, it's taken things to another type of bad? Well, I absolutely would say that the protests worked, that uh, people were suffering for three years. It was terrible, and there were horrible human rights abuses. The policy, the zero COVID policy was draconian, abusive, and unscientific. And people said, you know, we want freedom. We want to have a, to have a say in how our lives are governed. And then the government you know, felt pressure and they responded to it. And also it was, you know, because the economy was not doing well. So the, it's, the government respond to it is a good thing. It's just that it responded without, the way they responded, it wasn't good. You know, there was no planning. It, just, it, became, it came from zero COVID policy to no COVID policy. Mm. Andrew Long, was it right to change 180 degrees on something that so fundamentally affects people's lives and health? Well, um, I think there are uh, some uh, grave misunderstanding uh, of what China's uh, dynamic zero COVID policy is all about. It was not about achieving zero cases in all circumstances. It's an attempt to ensure uh, earliest possible detection, earliest possible isolation, earliest possible uh, cure and earliest possible prevention. But then so far, at least until um, uh, January 2022, at the beginning of this year, uh, according to um, independent, uh, renowned in, um, research institution based in New York, uh, the Elderman Trust Barometer, E-D-E-L-M-A-N, Elderman Trust Barometer. And they survey around the world and see how people um, regard the government's um, management of the pandemic, China came on in you know, multiple ranks above many, many other countries. Mm. Well, this shows that they, generally speaking, uh, China has been relatively successful uh, using its own vaccine all the time uh, to contain the, uh, the virus and uh, avoiding the spreading of the virus from province to province. However, it's now three years, people's patients beginning to wear thin. And obviously, there are um, uh, some protests, right. but the protests translate into um, a, a protest against the C government. It's a protest, it's a frustration. Right. My now, question however, was more, though, about, about the extreme choices, to go from such an extreme policy of protecting people, as you believe it was for, managing COVID with the so-called zero COVID policy, uh, to what there is now. I mean, how do you go from, from thousands of testing stations one day, accessible to most everyone, to basically zero overnight? That doesn't sound like properly prepared policy. Well, um, I think that the change, uh, of course, is quite rapid. Um, and um, a great a proportion of the population uh, simply not used to this because they, they were used to a compulsory uh, kind of testing, compulsory isolation. And then as the pandemic has now changed into uh, something like an endemic, um, in other words, you know, the, 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 uh, it's getting more and more infectious, but the death rate um, and, and uh, the serious cases are nowhere compared to what the virus first appeared, um, well, okay. just like many other countries. Uh, and, but then I think that people are used to this, and so there is a kind of a panic mode in stocking up medicine and, and so on and so forth. But there is, it's true that the elderly uh, death rate is increasing because of this change, mm -hmm. because of the rate is pretty low. Let uh, me ask... Uh, medical perspective yeah, I'd like to get Dr. Munir's medical perspective on this. I mean, medically and from a public health perspective, what do you make of this quite sudden policy change and the impact that it's had so far on the Chinese. Yeah, I mean, before going into this question, I just want to clarify, Andrea, that uh, it is not endemic. We are still in the middle of the pandemic and it is not over yet. And when we are in the middle of the pandemic and we particularly in China knew that the overall vaccine coverage is very low, and the efficacy of the vaccine that been used is already very low. And vast majority of the uh, risky people, like 60 and plus, they are not vaccinated. And then changing the paradigm from extreme uh, draconian measures to a no policy on the restriction at all. And this 
sudden and abrupt change is certainly ununderstandable, and particularly knowing that this virus is still circulating into the population, and it's every country are, is reporting the, the, the cases, and we know that this virus is not reached to its saturation for the evolution. So considering all the scientific basis, uh, I don't really see any uh, rationale about this abrupt change, how that has been designed, how that has been um, uh, programmed, because we know that if this situation carry on, the virus could evolve into something that could be more dangerous. And whenever there is any uh, a health crisis in China, it's not a health crisis of only China, it is for the globe. And we have witnessed this in the start of this pandemic. And considering all these factors, it's certainly ununderstandable. How can you go from one extreme, mm -hmm. to, extreme to another extreme within the matter of two weeks? Right. So first talk about, uh, doctor, what you think the consequences could be for the, the Chinese population, the consequences of zero exposure and no natural immunity, plus the low vaccination and, and lower efficacy rates of the vaccines. What is the Chinese population actually looking at? So what we know um, over the three years period of this pandemic is that 60 years and older are the ones that are more vulnerable. And if we look onto the Chinese population of 1.4 billion people, there are 267 million people over the age of 60, those are not vaccinated. And even if those are vaccinated, they are only vaccinated with two doses or three doses. And we do know that the immunity only lasts for four to six months. So fourth dose is compulsory. When you talk about millions of people needed to be vaccinated in relative shorter period of time when the virus is already ripping through the society, you can't really cope the vaccine coverage with the number of uh, infect infections happening. And what this leads to is a lot of people will be uh, getting sick and the majority of those one, particularly in the elder ages and mm -hmm. uh, also, mm -hmm. also into the vulnerable communities, they are going to require the health care services. And that strain right. onto the health care As we can lead, see yeah. from all the pictures we've been looking at on screen, uh, the health care system is severely strained. But also talk about will, heard mentioned, these new variants, these new mutations that could potentially be created from this massive new COVID wave in China. What does that mean for the globe? Absolutely. And I, I, just to put onto the, onto the prospect that we have over 300 different variants of the Omicron circulating around the globe. So the vast majority of cases now in China are happening because of the Omicron. And one of the variants, BQ1.1, is certainly more vaccine um, escaper. And a majority of the vaccines don't really work, even in the bivalent that we are having in the Western world. So considering the highly transmissible variant of the virus, which already have this uh, Factor established, and if it is allowed to communicate to, to spread within the community, all it would do is acquire the higher virulence and higher virulence along with the higher transmissibility is something that we should have been mm. avoiding in any context. And, and the strain onto the healthcare system is going to be uh, enormous. And the supply of the medicine as well as the testing is really shortage because that has been not dealt very well during these three years time right. from zero COVID policy. And that what does this mean for the globe is that the virus is going to spread out of the country to other countries where the vaccine coverage has been. So you can imagine by the end of January, this wave, if is even flattened by that time, vast majority of the countries in the Western world, they would be on their fourth or fifth dose yeah. of the vaccine is down, this virus is going to rip into those countries as well. As, as a doctor and a public health expert, just quickly, are you, are you angry at China's policy? I mean, we, we have three years to, to prepare, um, and we are not talking about the um, early 2020. We're talking about the end of 2020, 2022. And th during this time, if we haven't learned, I don't really know uh, when and how would we learn. Mm, okay. Uh, Yacho, let me come back to you because there's also an issue here about a very kind of unorthodox way now of counting actual COVID fatalities in China. It's really only counted if someone dies of pneumonia or another strictly respiratory illness. The WHO itself has said that is misleading. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's absolutely misleading. And the reason that the government was doing that, it was 
the government doesn't want to lose face because it has the zero COVID policy and the government has been churning out the propaganda saying it has been so successful. Look at the United States. Uh, more than a million people died, but we protected our people. Now they suddenly relaxed because protests, because the economy was not doing well and people were dying. And they refused to admit that uh, so many people are dying. So they kind of tweaked the, the, the definition of uh, you know dying from COVID to keep the number low because it doesn't want to lose face. Andrew, do you accept that? Well, there is a, a grain of truth uh, in, in, in that, in the sense that the, um, the policy has been changed um, very, very quickly. Not only the public is not prepared for it, uh, because they've been under the lockdown and the compulsory system to a voluntary system, um, and obviously uh, puts strains on people's psychology and to the, to the whole system. But suffice it to say that um, over these three years, uh, the death rate uh, so far has been kept very, very low. Uh, but then the problem is, lies with the, um, the elderly, uh, as mm -hmm. pointed out. I mean, the population is very large. Uh, but then uh, the fact remains that most of the population, the, the non-elderly, has a relatively high vaccination rate, something like 90%. Um, and additionally, uh, during these three years, China has built um, hundreds and thousands of capping uh, hospitals uh, to cope with the uh, eventuality. Right. But I think the problem lies in the lack of um, supply of uh, sufficient medical staff, uh, where uh, cases uh, happen uh, very, very quickly in certain areas. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the country is trying to cope. But I think if we, right. uh, overall, years, Looking at numbers, the number of deaths, uh, China hasn't uh, done you know too badly. I, I, I know you say that, but I mean the predictions now are that hundreds of millions of infections are expected, with the peak actually coming in March. So a possible one million deaths in the months to come. You have to wonder if all that boasting about how many lives were saved was all in vain. If we do see that million deaths in three months. What did China gain? Well, I I I I I, I doubt the, uh, the 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 validity of these uh, predictions. Uh, it, it's just a, a mathematical prediction. Uh, whereas the situation remains that the new variant uh, 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 has more into something like an endemic in in many cases. I mean, it's it's, it's it, there is no evidence to suggest a new variant is, has appeared in China. It's just like the, 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 the continuing development of this virus. And for example, in Hong Kong, um, uh, many of my friends have got infected and, and they just take some Chinese medicine and mm -hmm. after a couple of days, they're, and they're, they're, they're recovered. But then in China, on okay. the mainland, uh, are in a panic mode, as I said. I mean, they're not used to this. And this is compounded by the low vaccination rate of the elderly. Now, I think that this situation is likely to continue for a couple of more months before the, um, uh, the authorities, as well as the people okay. in China, getting used to this transition um, of this uh, virus uh, from a, a pandemic, uh, eventually into an endemic, as just like in many other countries around the world. Okay, Dr. Munir, do you think it's okay for China to kind of doubt those predictions, that the peak will be in March, potentially a million people could just could die uh, in the coming months? Is this actually, no, it's just a slightly difficult transition from one extreme to another, but they won't see those massive fatality rates on par with the United States and the UK, for example? Andrea, I unfortunately disagree with Andrew, uh, primarily onto the one grounding that we never say that the virus will be uh, evolving only in China. The question is that wherever the virus get the chance to infect vast majority of population which are not vaccinated, the chances for this virus to evolve would be higher. It doesn't matter whether it is in China, here in the UK or any part of the world. The question is that how much virus has the chance to evolve and it will carry on evolving. I think one of the things that we all understand and I have witnessed throughout the life of this pandemic is that it's very difficult to gauge the true impact of uh, COVID-19 in China. First, because the overall data that comes out is not really reliable. Can you imagine like yesterday, there were only 3,000 cases when we already see the the, the obvious, the, 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 the scale of this, uh, this wave and the way the, the number of cases are being counted. For example, at the moment, 
they are only counting those cases those are coming into the hospital with clinicals with clinical sign people who are tested um, in houses they are not counted people are asymptomatic these are not counted and a large scale testing is not happening mm. so based on all these these prediction i think it's very difficult to gauge the true impact until the real figures are not revealed to the global world and doctor is there another issue here about how far behind the chinese population may have fallen under years of lockdowns fallen behind in its immunity to other illnesses, you know, by lack of basic exposure that we were all getting incrementally while China was not. Yes, uh, absolutely, Andrea. That is not only specific to China, but ac across the globe, we have witnessed that, particularly the new generation, the children of uh, two or three years old, they have no exposure to the seasonal viruses, which normally do not cause disease, but they, they infect as a part of our um, our life, and we establish the immunity. And if that applies back into the China, where the vast majority of people are you know, either under vaccinated or have been locked down at a larger time duration compared to the rest part of the world. Overall, immunity is not as much trained as it would be in Western world or in Southeast Asia, in other countries where the lockdown hasn't been that stringent. That also poses one of the questions that if a COVID is now combined with influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, metanemoviruses, those are other respiratory viruses, what would be the fate of the population since then? Right. Yacho, why do you think it is after all this time and all the, the well, fear among... Oh, go ahead. Well, I think it's just the Chinese Communist Party can't govern. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012 and he started to grab more and more power to himself and it became, the system became... The political state became more and more rigid and the experts, people who actually know how to manage a pandemic, their opinions can't be factored into the decision making of the government. And also there's massive censorship going on online and people suffering are, cannot be you know, heard by the government because you know you can't talk about it. If you talk about it, you go to jail or your accounts get censored. So there's a lot of problem with the system that just they can't you know, manage it because of censorship, or because of lack of transparency, because of this one-man rule. Okay, and Andrew, let me ask you, I mean, why after all this time has China not developed or at least imported what they know is a more effective mRNA vaccine? They have nine vaccines on the market. They know they haven't been working as effectively as vaccines that have been distributed in the West and, and most of the rest of the world. Why that denial of this technology. And I have to remind you that German nationals in China, the vaccines from Pfizer are being imported specifically for only German nationals. Well, the Chinese themselves don't have access. Well, uh, it's not as if China is denying the uh, access to all uh, Western uh, medicine uh, against this virus. For example, China has allowed the use of the Paxaroy, but this is not a cure. It's only a, um, a kind of medicine which suppress some of the symptoms. So Paxaroy, of course, is developed in the West. But the doubt um, or the um, uh, concern about the mRNA, uh, this kind of new technology, uh, is not just unique to China. There, there have been some uh, speculations or even concerns expressed, uh, especially in the in the beginning uh, of the pandemic, um, that the technology may not be entirely safe uh, because this is the departure from established um, uh, methodologies. And then, uh, in fact, China was the one of the first countries to develop their own vaccines, mm -hmm. and then they have tried this vaccine on their own people. It seems to be very successful. As I said, it's borne up by the fact that after three years. Uh, the death rate has been extremely low. But here I would say that perhaps China is now um, a victim of its own success um, in, the, in, 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 in the fact that if you've got so many people not affected, then when the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the virus becomes more infectious, uh, and then people's immu Im Im immunity level um, mm -hmm. is low, even you're vaccinated. Okay. Whereas because they have... have exposed to the disease, you see. Okay. But that's a, a, a true... Dr. Munir, I want to get your take on that. And, and if you can finish on this, what you think China should do now in its public health interest? <laughs> I think several things need to be done. I think one of the thing as to connect your previous question is that they need to uh, come out of their, uh, you know, um, in-house 
brewed vaccines and uh, accept that the mrna best vaccine particularly the bivalents they are better and they need to import um, those vaccines and start deploying particularly into the elderly people that is for sure because without that they wouldn't be able to flatten the curve and if the flatten of the flattening of the curve is not achieved within the next couple of weeks then it's going to be a really big problem because of the lack of the vaccine coverage the second thing prom primarily they need to do now is to bring back some of the restrictions while they are preparing so that during that preparation uh, level there is a high level of immunity achieved and then they can open up back to dynamic zero or uh, zero um, uh, policy onto the restriction probably at that time they would have a better immunity protection without considering those things um, i don't really think that uh, they would be able to catch up the time um, for the uh, lunar year that would be end of january uh, if number of cases carry on going up and up at that time it, the chances for them to have more cases would be really really high okay that will have to be the final word for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much uh, for joining us and our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.